the sun, giver of light and life, shines most powerfully at the equator. Here, it powers an extraordinarily rich zone of life. Brilliant and bizarre species from three continents, three oceans. More than a line on a map, Equator is a powerful force of nature. Much of the equator traverses deep, empty ocean. But in the shallow seas of Indonesia, the tropical sun beats down on the world's greatest area of coral reefs. Coral reefs, created by the sun, overflow with extraordinary life. These reefs of riches are home to over 2,000 fish species. On a single dive, 283 different kinds of fish were counted here. This is a new world record. Even within fish families, there can be huge variety of shape, color, and occupations. The Ras family boasts 185 members, ranging from imposing giants to delicate cleaners. The whole reef community is so spectacular that it's attracting scientific attention. And of all the groups, most interest centers on corals. The sheer variety of corals is dazzling and confusing. And understanding this diversity could change our understanding of evolution. Why does this marine wonderland exist here, among the islands of Indonesia? The answer is that a unique set of forces converge here. The equatorial sun powers a network of ocean currents flowing through the thousands of islands spread out between Asia and Australia. The main through current is equivalent to the flow of a hundred Amazon rivers. But currents flow in all directions, and where they intersect at the western tip of New Guinea are found the richest reefs in the world at a place called Raja Ampat. The forest-covered limestone outcrops are largely untouched, Currents from many directions flow in deep channels and wash the reefs that fringe these islands. The currents are constantly bringing new arrivals to settle on these already crowded reefs. This hawksbill turtle has traveled thousands of kilometers on tropical currents to get here. Most fish have come just as far. From the coasts of Africa, the Americas and Japan, all shuffle together, all adding to the richness of life. The canyons and overhangs are vital shelter for schools of juvenile fish. Some were spawned here. Others drifted in on currents. Hiding away, they can feed and grow safe from predators. But the coral itself is also key to Raja Ampat's riches. There are over 400 different corals here. The best known 
are the branching types called staghorn or acropora. Based on shape, there are 350 acroporas, but by genetic analysis, there are only 170. So, how many are there? And more importantly, what exactly is a species? Corals are helping answer these puzzling questions. Coral reefs can be huge, vast, yet they are created by tiny creatures called polyps. Colonies of polyps build the reefs by secreting limestone. Polyps are animals. They use stinging tentacles to snare food from the current and draw it into their mouths. Staghorns, brain corals and plate corals are the major reef builders. But their impressive growth does not just come from a diet of plankton. They also soak up nutrients from fish. Any fish waste is recycled. But even being an ardent recycler is not enough to explain corals' tremendous growth. Their secret is solar power. The sun gives corals the extra energy to build massive reefs. So how do they do it? They do it by forging a powerful partnership with plants. Hundreds of millions of years ago, corals and plants came together to harness sunlight, thereby creating a major biological alliance. And that alliance is renewed when free-swimming algae colonize the polyps' bodies. Once swallowed, the coral's gut somehow recognizes these little aliens. And instead of digesting them, it wraps the algae in membranes and absorbs them. They are then moved towards the polyp's skin, where there's light. It's a partnership. The polyp provides nitrogen to the packaged algae, now called zooxanthellae. And they harness sunlight to make sugars, which helps their host to build reefs. But in the past, algae have also helped corals to survive. Different algae work better in different light and temperature conditions. And when conditions change, corals will exchange algae. Changing algae has helped reefs survive coral bleaching, sea level variation, and climatic upheaval over millions of years. These tiny partners have created huge limestone ramparts around the equator as altars to the sun. Corals strive for maximum surface area to capture maximum sunlight. The result is remarkable limestone sculptures. But they pay a price for worshipping the sun. They risk being choked by other sun lovers. A fine fuzz of seaweed grows vigorously over the reef surface. It's only constant grazing by reef fish that prevent corals from being smothered. They return the favor by providing shelter and protection. Staghorns offer the greatest protection. But get too close, you risk being stung by polyps. But the risk is worth it. Fish can venture out of their coral abode to feed. And then retreat in an instant.
The reef is much like an ancient city. There's a maze of narrow lanes and back streets for a sea snake to explore. A reef may be tens of thousands of years old, but corals never stop growing. And as they grow, they compete for space with their neighbors using chemicals and stinging cells. The conflict between coral neighbors gives the reef its maze-like structure. It creates a three-dimensional puzzle of gaps and crevices that's more like a giant sieve than a solid wall. Currents percolate throughout the reef, bringing food and oxygen to every creature. Crevices are eagerly sought by a myriad of shrimps and lobsters. Tasty crustaceans need all the protection they can find. Many arrived here as tiny larvae swept on currents from as far away as East Africa. Predators lurk in the rocky canyons. Stonefish are perfectly camouflaged for ambush hunting. But they have another tactic, burial. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free, no subscription required. With so many crevice dwellers, it's inevitable that many crevice predators have evolved as well. The sea snake is hunting for gobies and small eels. The reef attracts open water hunters too. When cuttlefish hunt, they flash. It's not certain why, but perhaps the rippling colors mesmerize small fish. They cruise the reef, scanning with sharp eyes that act like range finders. But not all tentacles are so mobile. This anemone waits for prey to touch its tentacles. They are primed. and ready to stun. The tentacles draw the victim into a central mouth. An anemone is a single polyp, a giant relative of tiny coral polyps. In fact, there are many other members of the stinging coral family on the reef. Soft corals can create colonies by cloning exact replicas of themselves. Others have opted for branching forms, mirroring the trees above them. But instead of leaves, Gorgonian fans have tiny polyps straining the current. Their branches shelter juvenile fish. Each elegant fan also hosts beautifully hidden residents. Gobies perfectly match their fan's color and form. But coral fans hide even more remarkable masters of disguise. There are at least five pygmy seahorses living on this branch. They're so specialized, they live only on Gorgonian fans. Most fan species here host their own matching species of pygmy seahorse. Many have been discovered only recently. The most recent is also the smallest. Hippocampus 
Denise is 16 millimeters head to tail, making it one of the smallest fish on the planet. A new type of fan inevitably leads to a new cast of creatures evolving to live on it. It's no wonder new species are being found here all the time. Most pygmy species are true stay-at-homes, not just because they precisely match their host fan, but also because their eggs are never sent away on the current. Like all seahorses, pygmy fathers carry eggs and young in a pouch. This male is heavily pregnant. His young are active, kicking against his pouch. They will soon swim away to find the exact host fan they need. The color must match, no other kind will do. The best known and most intimate host fish bond is that between anemones and clownfish. So why don't clownfish get stung by its tentacles? A young fish approaching a new anemone gently brushes against the tentacles, gradually anointing itself with mucus. After that, it never gets stung. Of nearly a thousand anemone species in the world, just 10 are hosts to clownfish. All 10 live in this region close to Raja Ampat. Anemones protect their clownfish, but it's a two-way partnership. The fish also protects its host from predators, and anemones are high on the menu for butterfly fish. Young anemones without resident clowns are highly vulnerable. Some, like this bulb tentacle anemone, are totally reliant on clownfish and cannot survive without them. In fact, their tentacles only become swollen and bulbous when they have acquired clownfish. Much about this relationship remains a mystery. Anemones have a special system for increasing their numbers. They clone themselves. This vast, waving field of tentacles began as one colonizing anemone. By dividing repeatedly, it produced a host of replicas. Cloning can only make identical copies. But the great variety of life on this sun-drenched reef has arisen by sexual reproduction. And it is sex that brings about change. Clownfish breeding is unique. On each anemone, the biggest fish in the group is always a female. She's attended by several males. And when she dies, the senior male changes sex within days and then takes over egg-laying duties. All their embryos begin life as males. A clownfish group can spawn all year round because there are no seasons to limit breeding at the equator. They lay a few hundred eggs and constantly care for the developing embryos. They're totally dedicated parents, unlike their neighbors. Out patrolling a patch of broken coral is a brightly colored mandarin fish. He displays his colors and keenness to mate, hoping to attract a female. When a female shows up, the pair engage in a brief courtship of fanning fins. This couple won't care for their young. Their strategy is mass production. As they rise, they release many thousands of eggs and sperm to mix in the water. Mandarin fish give their young a start in life, but that's all they do. 
The fertilized eggs are swept away on currents to distant reefs. Some as far off as Japan. Out on the reef edge are other mass spawning fish. But they also attract egg eaters like Benito. The predators gorge themselves, but the mass spawners will succeed. Surgeon fish release millions of eggs so that enough will survive to drift across the ocean and find a new reef. Many reef creatures are mass spawners, but none are as spectacular as corals. Once a year, around a full moon, an event takes place that is not only impressive, it's changing ideas about how species evolve. Corals can't move. The only way that the opposite sex can get together is mass spawning. On this one night, many closely related species spawn within a few hours of each other. Some corals produce eggs. Others, clouds of sperm. There are even corals that produce bundles of both. As they float away, bundles break apart, mixing with the spawn from thousands of others. Mass spawning is the only way corals can fertilize each other. And because it's sexual reproduction, the offspring will be different from their parents. And these differences are at the heart of recent scientific discoveries. At the equator, the drive to breed is matched only by the need to feed. The spawning attracts manta rays that filter the soup of eggs, and not far behind are fusiliers. Eggs will only survive if they can be rescued by ocean currents that will take them far away from the reef. Of the huge variety of corals that have spread around the equator, the Acropora or staghorns are the most widespread and the most puzzling. Most of the corals on this reef are Acropora, though you wouldn't know it. Their shapes are hugely varied. The most common is the branched version called staghorn that fish use for protection and food. But they can also spread their branches into spectacular flattened plate forms. And exposed to waves, they are stocky and robust. In sheltered deep water, they grow long and slender reaching for the light. They all look very different, but all these amazing forms are Acropora. Their appearance is so variable that it's almost impossible to define exactly which species is which. In fact, corals are deceptive. It's been discovered that they can interbreed. Mass spawning makes interbreeding possible because up to 30 related corals will spawn together. It happens when the sperm from one species fertilizes the egg of one that's closely related. If this happens, a hybrid is produced. But mass spawning gives corals plenty of chances to create hybrids. And they are a fast-track way to new species. Even if a hybrid begins to grow, 
its chances of survival are slim. It's at the mercy of the currents and ocean predators. If it stays alive, it may drift vast distances. And as it travels, it grows into a swimming larva called a planula. If the planula finds a new reef, it searches for a place to settle. Finding a space, it glues itself to the reef. The tiny hybrid then begins to grow. It has qualities from both its parents. And if these qualities suit conditions on the new reef, it will flourish, founding a new species. A hybrid makes an unusual addition to a coral family tree. As a coral family evolves, each new branch represents a new species, diverging and growing ever more separate from its ancestors. But whenever species interbreed, the branches reconnect. Those that rejoin are hybrids. And each new species is usually a coral that's evolved after drifting on currents to a new home on a distant reef. There have been times in our planet's past when far-flung corals have returned. This occurred when successive ice ages gripped the world. Advancing ice sheets froze polar seas, causing global sea levels to fall as much as 120 meters. In southern Asia, falling sea levels connected islands, closing ocean channels. Increasingly powerful ocean currents rushed through the remaining gaps, sending corals great distances and bringing others back from far-flung reefs. When the ice melted and sea levels rose, the currents weakened and corals stayed closer to home. Over millennia, this process repeated many times. On a grand scale, the pulse of the ice ages is mirrored in the coral family tree. Strong currents caused isolated corals to return and merge again into fewer species. During ice ages, reefs were dominated by just a few corals. Right now, sea levels are high. That means corals remain isolated and they're hybridizing into more new coral species. And that's what we see today at Raja Ampat. Corals are helping redefine exactly what is a species. And that means understanding staghorns has got a whole lot simpler. All species that hybridize with each other are now united as superspecies. This means that what were hundreds of different staghorns are now linked in networks of around 20 superspecies. But this is just the beginning. Here at the equator, there may be many more hybrids and more superspecies awaiting discovery. Could these networks also be found among reef fish? Many fish families are so large and diverse, anything's possible. The wrasse family ranges from giant predators like the humphead wrasse to tiny cleaner wrasses that pick parasites from the gills and scales of their clients. Fish wanting to be clean drift passively with fins lowered to signal that they're ready. Some cleaners are juvenile wrasses that give up cleaning when they grow too large. But there are many other jobs among the 185 species in this family. Rock-moving wrasses turn over broken coral to feed on small animals.
They're trailed by a yellow checkerboard wrasse, which specializes in claiming their leftovers. A juvenile rock mover looks nothing like its parents. In the wrasse world, changing shape and color as you grow is quite normal. So is changing sex. Among wrasses, it's always females that become males. This is a mature male crescent wrasse. He's blue now, but a year ago, he was a green female. Appearances can be deceptive. There could be hybrids and superspecies hidden among the wrasse family, but proving it will be no easy task. When giant mantas come to the reef edge, adult crescent wrasses hurry out to meet them. These giants, up to six meters across, gather here to be cleaned of parasites. But the current is exceptionally strong, and some of the cleaning gang have difficulty catching up with their clients. It's most unusual to see fully grown wrasses reverting to the cleaning role of their youth, but a giant manta loaded with tasty parasites is an exceptionally large opportunity. Back on the reef, other specialist groups include the guild of pointy mouths. With tweezer-shaped jaws designed to probe crevices and nip coral polyps. Butterflyfish, Moorish idols and bannerfish all make their living in this special way. But on the reef, it pays to be adaptable. Many of these pointy mouths lead double lives beyond the reef. Out over the reef edge, cliffs drop vertically over a thousand meters. There's an explosion of life here as sunlit waters of 29 degrees mix with upwelling, nutrient-rich cold waters. Out here, butterfly fish dine on plankton swept up in the water column. The upwelling brings more than plankton. It also brings mysterious giants from the deep. Sunfish rise from feeding grounds far below to warm up and digest their food. The huge fish are crawling with copepods, parasites that feed on blood and mucus and make their hosts very uncomfortable. But bannerfish swim out from the reef to relieve them of their burden. The three-meter sunfish hovers as if in a trance while more bannerfish arrive for a parasite banquet. The cleaner's pointed mouths are as sharp as forceps. Eventually, the sunfish has had enough of the painful skin treatment and departs. One group of fish have an enormous impact on the reef itself and far beyond it too. Parrotfish with their powerful biting beaks are coral predators. They grind up the coral skeletons with bony tooth plates in their throat to extract nutrients from polyps and algae. But all the ground up coral has to go somewhere. Parrotfish convert coral into sand. Bleakers parrotfish travel in schools, filling the water with a sound of chomping and a blizzard of sandy waste. Huge Bumphead parrotfish are the most prolific sand makers. 
Their beaks are powerful enough to attack massive parietes corals, leaving deep scars. Bumpheads can even shear off the arms of staghorn corals. Each one chews a cubic meter of coral a year, and most of it becomes sand. The entire group of sand makers could smother the reefs. But most sand is swept away by currents. It accumulates where there are eddies to form the shimmering islands that the equator is famous for. So parrotfish create new places for long distance travelers to rest and breed. They also create a completely new underwater world. Juvenile striped catfish seek food among the sand grains. They're protected by venomous spines, vital defense when feeding in the open. Out here, the most diverse group of fish are the gobies. The signal goby also sifts for tiny creatures. It has evolved eye spots on its dorsal fin, the same distance apart as the eyes of larger predators. The open sand has few hiding places. So the mural goby has to dig to conceal itself. It works hard, but all the movement attracts a predator. The Wobegong shark waits for the goby to let its guard down, just for a moment. One way to defeat predators is to find an ally. Shrimps are tireless diggers, but they have poor eyesight, whereas gobies have excellent eyesight and can warn the shrimps when to hide. The horn-headed sea snake is persistent but eventually it must surface to breathe. White sands aren't the only sandy environment beyond the reef. The region is dotted with volcanoes. With such powerful volcanic forces at work, the coastline and seabed have undergone turbulent upheavals. Over the past 50 million years, the seabed has been twisted and torn by shifting tectonic plates. But during all these convulsions, there were always safe havens for corals and shallow sunlit waters in the equatorial Indo-Pacific. When volcanoes erupt, reefs are often destroyed by lava or smothered in black sand. But in the tropics, a clean slate never stays clean for long. Mantis shrimps are early arrivals from nearby reefs. This one cradles an egg bundle. It isn't long before a new generation of mantis shrimps sets up home out here. Over generations, they could become new forms and new species. There are 34 species of mantis shrimp around Raja Ampat. There might soon be one more. An emperor shrimp arrives as a hitchhiker on a sea cucumber. The shrimp picks spare food from the sea cucumber's feather mouth. Both animals are unpleasant to eat, so they're safe out on the bare sand. Strange new species of burrowing fish are being uncovered all the time. Some recent arrivals aren't camouflaged to match the black sand. Out here, just as on the reef,
Camouflage is the most obvious way of adapting to the new environment. A black anemone has evolved here. And of course, there are matching colored clownfish. Clownfish lay their eggs on a hard surface. Out here, saddleback clowns push a shell under the anemone as an egg-laying platform. They work hard to keep their eggs free of silt. Trickery is rife on the black sand. Anglerfish use a lure, which is a modified dorsal fin, to attract fish to their last meal. Many anglerfish are impressive sponge mimics, until a yawn gives the game away. This one has evolved to match volcanic rock, but the same species looks just like a yellow sponge. With all these differences within one species, it's near impossible to work out who is related to who. But once they settle, anglerfish camouflage is perfect, and the trap is set. Some use the opposite strategy. Bold colors worn to stay away from nasty spines. Raja Ampat's mollusks are famous for their bright colors. Sea slugs have no protective shells, yet are not bothered by predators because they're very toxic. They absorb poisons from sponges, hydroids, and other animals. There are more sea slugs in this region than anywhere else, and most advertise their toxicity with outrageous displays. Such bold warning colors are so successful that others have borrowed the idea. Yellow striped fish known as sweet lips are commonly seen hovering above the reef. But their juveniles couldn't be more different. They mimic the colors and even the swimming style of sea slugs. Juvenile sweet lips are not poisonous at all. It's just trickery. This outlandish scorpion fish is a weed imitator. Its weedy fins break up its outline, making it unrecognizable as a predator. Once again, in species-rich Raja Ampat, a winning adaptation leads to a whole array of other scorpionfish and lionfish evolving variations on the weedy theme. Perhaps this is another superspecies waiting to be discovered. The most astonishing mimics take on the appearance of dead leaves waving in the current, something no predator would look at. Even the wrasse family has a leaf mimic, with a modified fin that looks like a stalk. But the presence of leaf imitators means leaves and the proximity of another great tropical habitat, mangroves. The leaves fertilize a vast coastal food web that draws many fish into the murky estuaries and rivers. The Indo-Pacific is mangrove capital of the world. Under the equator's oppressive heat, over 50 species of mangrove trees colonize the border between land and sea. They dominate the tropical coastline where conditions are too silty for corals. It's been recently discovered that mangroves have hybrid forms. So perhaps there's a super species in their family tree as well. 
This murky world is the realm of a very successful goby. Mudskippers are fish out of water, absorbing oxygen through moisture trapped around their gills. When the tide drops, it slides on the mudflats and sucks up algae. It's an endless food source, but how does this little fish avoid being grilled under the equatorial sun? Now the goby digging skills are put to good use. A mudskipper excavates a swimming pool large enough to keep itself moist for hours until the tide allows it to return to the shade of the trees. But Raja Ampat has mangroves that are special. Here they grow in waters that are clear. Mud is absent. To find mangroves growing side by side with soft and hard corals on clear shallow reefs is most unusual. Familiar characters of the reef like clownfish, cleaner wrasses and crescent wrasses live alongside mangrove dwellers like half-beaks and archerfish. It's very strange. But then Raja Ampad is at a unique crossroads where marine life from the coral reef, mangroves, coral sand and volcanic sand all meet and mingle. Strange, new evolutionary relationships are bound to unfold here. To take better advantage of the currents, soft corals even perch on mangrove roots. But in the darkest tangle of the mangroves, there are no sun-loving corals. Here, I found a family of fish so amazingly adaptable, they've matched virtually every environment Raja Ampat has to offer. Inside the mangroves, each cardinal fish species schools at different levels. Brown at the bottom, and orbicular cardinals near the surface. Cardinal fish are mouth brooders. The fathers constantly turn the eggs in their mouths until they're ready to be spat out, like these young. Their early lives are spent close to their parents, and they will never travel far from the mangroves. Back in the sunlight, pajama cardinals have specialised to shelter in the arms of staghorn corals. Because they too are mouth brooders, their eggs are never set adrift on currents. The male's care keeps their young close to home and closely adapted to life among the staghorns. Just below the mangroves and coral gardens, Cardinal fish have adapted to living with a surprising partner. Out on the sand, there are urchins. And living between their venomous spines are frost finned cardinal fish. They travel everywhere the urchin travels. It's a good strategy. Straying from cover is always perilous. The most specialised of all are Bangai cardinal fish. They're the ultimate stay-at-homes found only around Bangai Island. They compete with clownfish for an unoccupied anemone, but the larger clowns soon expel them. And the cardinals are driven away from cover and into the path of a stonefish. 
It's all about survival of the fittest. And cardinal fish are real survivors. There are now 109 different species. Cardinal fish have been shaped by predation and competition and larger forces like changing climate and sea level. All of their new species have arisen through natural selection. Ideas of evolution by natural selection go back more than 150 years to when Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace studied the wealth of life around the equator. And scientists at the equator are still refining those ideas. The latest notion that some creatures interbreed, hybridize, and exist in networks or superspecies is another bold step forwards. Raja Ampat is right at the crossroads of current flow and gene flow around the equatorial oceans of the world. Of all the places to observe and study evolution in action, Raja Ampat's sun-drenched reefs of riches are the perfect biological laboratory. Who knows what may be discovered here in the future?